Right, welcome back uh, to the uh, post-coffee session, I guess, um, for, the, for the keynote. Um, and I'd like to introduce uh, two people uh, for the keynote, and then we've got around the round table and then the film. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to introduce Joe Wilson, um, uh, <laughs> who is the Greater Manchester uh, Network Administrator at uh, Street Support Network, um, and a former homeless advisor to the Greater Manchester Mayor's Office. Um, she, uh, and and this, these were her words, she has a great sense of humour, <laughs> but is possibly not as funny as she thinks she is. Um, I am. Which, uh, many people said about me too, uh, apart from the not great sense of humour. but I am. <laughs> Um, and then I'd also like to introduce, uh, uh, presenting with Joe, um, is Matt Peacock, MBE, um, who is director of Win With One Voice, uh, which aims to connect and strengthen arts and homeless projects around the world. Um, he is passionate about the arts being integrated into homelessness support, helping people to thrive and not just survive. He was founder of Streetwise Opera, who we'll be hearing tomorrow, uh, and one of the Evening Standard's most influential Londoners. Um, so over to uh, Joe and Matt. Just to say, I am so funny, I've broke my humorous bone, that's how funny. Oh. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> so just um, want to start with a little bit about um, the Manchester Homelessness Charter, which kind of started out in 2016, so we're into our third year now. It's, it's, so the partnership kind of started up because um, there was the tent city protests in Manchester, um, spice was coming in massively rather than heroin use, there was a load of welfare reform, budget cuts. Also because the council were kind of, there's loads of budget cuts and the voluntary sector were like fighting against each other, someone was saying before it's like a competition for funding, which was what was kind of happening everywhere. So um, the council, different organisations were, you know, we're not sending this person to you because we need that person to do our door to get our numbers so we can get funding. Manchester City Council, in their wisdom, who normally quite an arrogant council, we're kind of an arrogant city, um, they actually said to everybody, we can't do this on our own, we need help from everybody. So what we need is we need um, the voluntary sector, health, people with personal insight into homelessness, the faith sector, the DWP, the police, the fire service, even businesses all to come in and kind of talk to each other and to work around at each other and work with each other rather than against each other because they were kind of rubbing against each other. Businesses were like, you know, putting Selfridges, putting the little nobbles outside the shop so people couldn't sleep there and we don't want people sleeping here, it's ruining our business. So rather than having nobody talking to them, We've got like the business sector who now come in and speak to us. Um, that's kind of how it started, and there's a load of action groups, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a minute. Um, what I kind of go on to is the numbers in Manchester. So when it first started the chart, the numbers were, um, you'd think they'd have gone down by now, but they haven't. So when we first started, there was like five and a half thousand plus homelessness presentations at Manchester City Council. I have got the numbers yesterday from the council for the last three years. So the kind of the year after they was kind of the same, 2017, 18, gone up by about 500. 18, 19, they've gone up. So in the last year, they've gone up by 2000. So there's like 8,149 presentations at the council now, which is not good. I mean, we kind of think it could be because Greater Manchester was, so Andy Burnham introduced the a bed every night thing last year. Maybe it's because of that, because we've had a lot of people coming in saying, they just come into the council and present and go, so I want my bed every night, which is kind of not how it works. <laughs> Anybody who was coming in and saying stuff like that. Um, funded temporary accommodation, there was like just over 1,300. Now there's like 2,000 and 1,400 of them are families. Uh, floating support, there's like now 1,500 people that are getting floating support. And then three years ago, it was kind of... Um, support was designed for 146, but there were 663 being supported. I don't have the rough sleeper head count because I wasn't given that. Um, the B&Bs is kind of the same numbers, so um, not a lot's really changed in that, although I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so if we're going to this Manchester Homeless Charter um, and the partnership um, had... The Charter has like, the vision and values which is put together with everybody, like the citizens of Manchester, the council, again, healthcare, public sector. I mean, you can read it all up there anyway, who was involved in it. So what we had was people, different organisations were asking them for a pledge. So like the police pledged to, we will treat everybody with respect rather than just get up, move on, off you go. It was kind of treat everybody with respect, we will try and refer people into places. 
the police it, the police have a little um, station in Manchester Town Hall that works with the rough sleepers. So like, they, can't, they have kind of changed the way they work, but not enough, I don't suppose. Oh, I don't think they've changed enough. Anyway, I think the police are still a little bit awkward with people. But um, So the, the actual charter was written by everybody, with people with lived experience who, I hate that term, but um, they came in and had their voice in it. They designed it. it was, uh, they were a massive part in like, having all this and... I don't know, it's kind of uh, really important within Manchester's, like the stuff within Manchester City Council, how they've changed the way they work is within their homelessness department now. As a result of the charter, anybody who wants to come in for an interview for any job within the homelessness department, there has to be somebody who's got personal insight of homelessness on the interview panel, had some sort of um, training rather than just coming in and go, you come and sit here and have this and we'll, you ask this question, it's kind of what question do you want to ask people? You've got a different perspective to us. We just like want to ask them where they've worked in a statutory service before. We want to talk to them like a council will talk to them and want to hear that back. But somebody's got personal insight, we'll ask a different question and kind of, <laughs> it can throw people a little bit because I've been on some of them interview panels and they're kind of, oh, okay, so why are you here on an interview panel? You don't work for a council or the health service or anything. But it's massively changed within Manchester councils, the way they approach things, the way people, in, down into the design of um, the contact centre downstairs in the council, people had, there was a, one of the action groups was presenting as homeless, and the way, because they were kind of a little bit awkward with people when they walked in, and it was like, you sit there, and you, we'll, we'll move you away from everybody else because you're coming in with all your bags. But now it's kind of, no, you can stay, you know. We, previously it was if you go out for a cig and your number gets called, tough, come back tomorrow. Now it's kind of, you don't need to do that. You know, you come back in, we'll come, someone will come out and get you. It doesn't always happen because it's still quite a lot of people going in, but it's, it's working a little bit better. Um, so the chart, the key principles were around co-production, systems change, the whole city approach with all the organisations and the business sector and everybody. And, the action groups. The originally to start with, there was only 10 action groups. Some have opened and closed. So originally we had um, a women's direct access one, which was the direct access place in Manchester was needed redoing up. So they thought, well, we'll have that as one of the action groups because it represents women. And it was how we decorate it, what you want from this service. But it ended up being, um, here's five different colours of paint. What colour do you want the walls painting? And here's three different sofas that you can choose from. So not completely co-produced, not like you can choose from any. You can choose from this, you can choose from that. So the little bit of learning from that, that there's now um, a women's homelessness involvement group. Uh, it was originally called a women's homelessness action group, but because it said WAG, people didn't like it. So they called it WIG instead. Um, <laughs> they, <laughs> they, so we, we've now also got um, a women's influence worker who... It's an 18 month contract for her, um, so she's trying to change things within Manchester with the women's stuff. Not enough stuff different for women, but I think, although there's quite a lot of women that work at the top in Manchester City Council within homelessness, and they say they get the difference that women need to what men's needs are, they kind of don't because they've never been through it. It's just like, yeah, it's all right, we'll put some tampons and some sanitary towels in the toilets, and that's fine then, you know, it's women's different service, and it's like, no, it's not. It's kind of, you know, a little bit more complex than that. Um, the mental health group has been really successful. That has produced a report called Cause and Consequence, which has been, um, that was chaired by um, Inspiring Change Manchester, which is Manchester's version of uh, Fulfilling Lives Project. Employment opportunities, they are working with... Um, in Manchester, there's loads of regeneration going on in Manchester, and we have a project called the St John's project which is where Granada Studios used to be. Millions of pounds going into it, move the homeless on from there but nobody's working with you to see if we can get you a job there so there's a company called Allied London that works within the partnership with us who are brilliant and they have pledged to get, 20, I know it's not a very large number but 20 people into work. It was within the year but I'm not sure they got 20 people in so now we have somebody working with them all the time because we have a business worker now. We've actually got two people who are now employed by the homeless partnership. 
So we've got somebody who works on a co-production level and somebody who works with businesses. The business worker has tried to get businesses to come in, change the way they are, explain to them the differences between all the different... Because people just think homelessness, well, it's everybody who's rough sleeping. It's like, no, it's not. You know, it's uh, larger than that. It's people in unsupported temporary accommodation, people in supported accommodation, sofa surfers, people who are staying with the parents but are then getting kicked out, people coming out of care. And somebody was saying before about people coming out of prison. Uh, it's the same everywhere, not just in Lincoln. People coming out of prison with no support is just ridiculous. And at the moment, the prison estate is like... Re all the prison estates changing. So, for instance, people used to come out of strange ways, and it was um, you could you came out of there no support. Now, it's just long term in strange ways, and people are getting all moved over to Forest Bank. So, the amount of people that are coming out of there on a daily basis with nothing. It's a lot of people that you know they're not getting picked up in there. Shelter, what's the shelter of a thing in there that it's they're supposed to be picking people up to see everybody within five days of going in to make sure that they get something for when they come out, they don't see everybody within five days. They can't possibly see everybody within five days. They haven't got enough staff to see everybody within five days, although they won't admit that they don't see everybody. Um, so we've got a, a small charity in Manchester that's now had some funding to help with that because they were doing everything on such a small budget that it was really... I don't know how they were actually doing everything. Um, the evening services stuff was kind of around soup kitchens in Manchester because there were so many soup kitchens on the streets that there was so litter everywhere and people are just lining up at five o'clock to get something to eat. Drug dealers are turning up because they know everybody's going to be there at that time. So what we wanted to do was get people to come inside to serve food because who wants to stand out on the street at five o'clock when everyone's leaving up work to go home and going, oh look, there they all are getting the food again every night. So we brought some people in. We've got um, an organisation called Coffee for Craig who came in and work with us. A lot, see, it's kind of awkward. A lot of them are faith based groups. A lot of them, obviously, the voluntary sector, some of them don't want to work with us. They don't want to come inside because they like the fact that people can see them doing their good work outside on the street. People don't, and, and, and people will still line up and get the food there because where else are they going to get it? But we've got people now to come inside, which is a lot better because then they're not stood out in the rain because it rains a lot. So when people are coming inside, they're getting support, whereas when they stood on the street, the organisations are just like, here's some food, see you next week. Another one, here's some food, see you next week. Whereas they're coming inside with coffee for Craig. Now we've got support services with them, we've got a nurse in there. So when they, for they need anything, get socks, whatever else they need. Um, it works a lot better. There was a little bit of teething problems with it, but it's now much better. We have... One of the other groups, big change. So we've got an alternative giving campaign in Manchester. So somebody was saying before about not giving to people on the street, which is what we, as a Greater Manchester approach, is what we recommend don't give to people on the street. If you want to give some money to somebody, give it either to whichever charity you choose to or give it to big change. Big change will then help people to get off the street. So if they're going through uh, one of the day centres and they've got somewhere, they can get as much as... Well, as little as £4 for a bus ticket to get to a doctor's appointment and then as much as up to £1,000 to get furniture for a new property that they've been into. That has added up to, uh, I think, 250 grand. I think, has gone through it already, which is the most successful um, alternative giving campaign in the country, which I'm quite proud of. Um, so the partnership, how it works, is kind of at the top of it, we've got um, the partnership board, which has got... Um, all the big hitters on it, so it's like the Bishop of Manchester, the top people from the health, the council, the police and everything. Then we have the action groups who, each action group has somebody with lived experience and somebody who works within the services that uh, something to do with whichever that action group is that are chairing it. So, we've, so there's got to be somebody with lived experience that's either the chair or the co-chair um, because we need that voice within it. Um, a lot of the initiative, like the citywide strategy, I think that comes up in a minute, but like the Big Change Manchester, as our Big Change has kind of been extended, now we've got Real Change, which is going into the other nine boroughs of Greater Manchester. Um, the Partnership Board meets like every three months, and it's, it's, it's a kind of a little bit of a static, so it can be really boring, because we've got 
the bishop chairs it and everybody's like, health come in and say, what have you been doing? And a lot of people sat there going, what's going on? This is just the same thing that you said last time, you know, nothing's changing. So they've changed it up a little bit and had a couple of workshops. So we've had different, we had different groups coming in. So we had the, um, the police came in and did a little workshop. Uh, the women's action group and the mental health did, group did a workshop. So when the police could come in and they were sat at a table and go around the different tables and you can see what the police are doing and what they've changed, whether they've changed anything, um, asking them questions, why aren't you doing this or why have you changed this sort of thing. So that we did that at the last one, which was quite successful and everybody was like, it's miles better than it was last time. Then as all, we come into this group and we're all just sitting in a big boardroom, sat around a table and half of them are falling asleep listening to nothing pretty much <laughs> um, so this was the day of the launch of the charter in 2016 so you can see we've got the police and the bishop of manchester and the fire brigade and people from health people that got lived experience people from the voluntary sector i love the big picture that was in the evening news on granada reports and everything for everybody to see look at us all we've even got city councillors and stuff look at us all we're all doing this all together um, which was kind of, kind of nice, it was a great day. There was like, I think 400 people turned up from, still not enough representation for people that have been homeless, but better than would have been previously. Um, so the Manchester Homelessness Strategy now, the new one, normally written by the council, and that is it, nobody else has any input into it. This time, it's not a Manchester City Council strategy, it's actually a Manchester citywide strategy. So. It wasn't just written by the council. There was a group of people that got together from the voluntary sector, from the health, same kind of thing, and people with lived experience that sat and wrote the Manchester Homeless Strategy. So it's now, rather than it being written in what I like to call council speak, because of the language that they use that kind of excludes people, it's now written in normal language that everybody can read and that everybody can understand rather than all the big acronyms and stuff in it and everything that people haven't got a clue what they mean, but sat in a meeting, don't want to stick their hand up and go, what does that mean? I don't understand. Um, so now it's written by everybody. It's for everybody. It's easy to understand. And it's just miles better. I think it's like a two page document. There is, and, and obviously that's like the executive, there is a bigger document that it was kind of, that'll go around for the council, but the main part of it is written by Everybody. And I think that's Matt's turn. Yes. Uh, so um, I pick up the story uh, in just in 2015 and 2016 uh, when the Charter was um, in its infancy. <laughs> And you may ask, um, what, what relevance does an arts project have in this? Um, With One Voice is a global uh, arts and homelessness uh, movement, so we're um, recognising the value of arts in homelessness support and connecting incredible work that's going on, um, strengthening existing um, projects um, and influencing a little bit of policy as well. Um, and the reason why arts was really relevant was because, as you saw before, as soon as um, people who are or have been homeless were given uh, the platform and the permission to write their own homelessness strategy in Manchester, the arts became an incredibly important part of it and there was an arts, um, an arts action group, uh, which there still is, a very active one. So what we were doing at that point was, um, With One Voice started off as a project within Streetwise Opera, which is um, uh, an organisation I started 17 years ago, um, having been a support worker. So I was in a day centre in London and all the um, uh, uh, people I was working with were saying, you know, this is great, got um, support from uh, um, the, the statutory services and there's, there's a bed here and there's enough food, but it's not, that's not enough. Um, we need other ways to um, uh, change perception, change uh, identity from um, people who other people see as people with needs and, and uh, difficulties to people with um, skills and achievements. Um, and at that point, again, arts was uh, uh, quite active, but still not that well known um, and certainly not that well valued in, in the sector. Um, but we also knew that 30% um, of the people that we were working with, um, that, that, that uh, uh, well-being statistics 
uh, for the people we were working with were 30% lower than the national average. There was seven times um, higher suicide rates. And the arts is beginning to get better and have more robust terminology and methodology about proving how it can uh, uh, build well-being and um, mitigate loneliness, social isolation and increase self-expression. So at that point in 2012, we, we were there with a cultural Olympiad in London saying we want to give a platform to people who are, who are or have been homeless. Um, and they put the word out to the arts and homelessness sector and collectively we asked our performers, our artists, and they said, yes, we do want a platform. We want to show the public what we can do. We want to change this narrative from people with needs to people with skills. We brought people together, um, 34 organisations, 300 homeless people took over the Royal Opera House and we put on an event called With One Voice. When Rio 2016 happened, Rio wanted to have a similar kind of project. Um, that project ended up being much more about capacity building. There was only two or three recognised projects where there, as there were at the, at the time in 2012 about 30, 40 recognised projects in the UK. Um, so we just did some exchanges and we brought some brilliant um, projects from Brazil over to the UK, to Manchester in London and vice versa. And we'd heard about the Manchester Charter and how the voice of uh, homeless people was absolutely running top to bottom throughout the whole system and how the arts was part of the, the narrative. And we also knew in Brazil, having done a lot of research there, that there was this programme called the Movement of the, the Population of the Streets, Movimento Populacao da Rua, which is a completely self-managed, 100% um, representative uh, 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 people living on the streets of all the cities in Brazil, having a legislative link to local government. So because of various atrocities that had happened um, to rough sleepers in Brazil, um, the public uh, uh, forced the government to have a legislative link. So every single um, street movement in every single city, and now it's in every single state in every city, uh, has a direct link and uh, every month they meet with the local council uh, um, to talk about homelessness services and they sit on panels. Um, it's, it's fantastic. We wanted to show the charter about this incredible work and also how the arts also is being used not just um, as an add-on, not just uh, to bolster well-being, uh, however important that is, but actually used by the uh, human rights departments in the cities uh, to increase people's voice, to give them a platform, and to enable other uh, human rights to be discussed. So this is um, one of the first, uh, is that gonna work, Nick? One of the first projects we saw in Sao Paulo, which was this art cart, and the human rights team, not the culture team, the human rights team were bringing along this cart full of poetry material and art artistic material in order to engage people, but then to talk about other human rights, human rights infringements that they were, uh, that people on the streets were suffering from. So just this idea of the, of the value of the arts not being a bolt-on, but running through absolutely everything, we knew would also um, be an inspiration for Manchester and then uh, vice versa, what was happening in Manchester would be an inspiration in, in Brazil. And very soon after that, an incredible project um, happened in Manchester, the Manchester Street Poem. So the Manchester Street Poem, back to me, uh, came about because in Manchester we have an international festival every two years. It started in 2009, I think, so it's every two years. Um, in 2017, um, we had, so the artist Carl Hyde, who some of you might know from the band Underworld, the Laga 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 song from, what's that, Train Spotting? I I didn't, to be fair, I didn't have a clue who he was when he first came in. <laughs> um, so he came in and... He was asked, he, wanted to do, he was commissioned to do a project for the um, festival and so he wanted to do something around homelessness because he'd previously done the Tokyo Street Poem, but they were all his words, so he'd gone around Tokyo and then done a Tokyo Street Poem but written it in his words. What we decided that we wanted to do was kind of the same thing, but have people who'd been through homelessness have their stories written. So what we did was um, a group of us um, interviewed, recorded, everybody who did the interviews and recording it all had some sort of insight into homelessness and interviewed about 35 different people. And then Carl, they, they were edited down to, um, it had to be a certain length because we let people talk, some people had talked for five, with four basic <laughs> questions, which was uh, where you're from, how did you get where you are, um, what are your hopes for the future, and what's your favorite piece of music? Um, 
so some people would talk, they'd answer it in quick one sentence and it was done in five minutes. Other people were sat and talked half an hour, 45 minutes. So some had to be edited down, not changing the words, just like making it short so it could be written on the wall. When we came to do it, Carl, he was the draw to get everybody in and he was the one that was writing the stories. Um, last year in Manchester, we had the very first International Arts and Homelessness Summit. So we did another version of the street poem where people were writing their own stories. And although Carl was there, he wasn't, although he had some input into it, he wasn't the one that was doing the writing. He did one and most of the other people came in and did it themselves. This year for the International Festival, um, with what we've done this year is instead of it being inside a store and people could come in and see it different daily as it's building up, what we've done is we've got one of the arches in Manchester and people coming in, they're writing their story and it's been printed the next day and then put in Festival Square, which is Albert Square in Manchester outside the town hall. And it's been put on um, a massive, so it, the top one, the top corner is where they were um, writing it. And so right along that wall, that is being printed out and put right along Festival Square for everybody to stand and to read. And then we've got people, usually the person whose story's up, it's a different story every day. So usually the person whose story's up is there on Festival Square. So if people want to interact with them and talk and ask them what it is, then they can explain because it was a massive draw in 2017, so we wanted to carry it on. It's been really successful, actually. It's really good. Um, so, have we got, like, a couple of minutes? <coughs> Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, but carry on anyway. Right, a couple of minutes. So, what we were finding um, with the integration of the arts and, and um, uh, homeless support systems was that what we were hearing from everyone is that if you put someone in the middle of, of the services um, who then dictates what happens, you find a very different system. They build a very different system to what has historically been a, quite a Maslowian um, system. And I don't know if many of you are familiar with Maslow, but it's like a sort of hierarchy of needs that runs through society where, you know, you start off with food and shelter and then the next important thing is maybe education and the next important thing which relegates things like communities and people being together and nurturing each other and arts and creativity as therefore much less important what everyone was saying was you know on the day i became homeless i didn't need you know shelter that day and then six months later i needed an arts project i needed friends i needed love you know it's all part of a jigsaw so with One Voice together with the Charter developed this model, co-produced um, with uh, people with an insight of homelessness, which shows um, what everyone thought was the most important things right on day one of homelessness. Education training, employment, arts and creativity, sports and leisure, policy, housing tenancy support, mental and physical health, food, recovery, community and relationships. You can argue that certain bits of the jigsaw are, less, uh, are, are smaller than others, but this is a fundamental uh, th theoretical model, which um, we believe in Manchester, it, it uh, runs through everything. It's now part of the Manchester Homelessness Strategy. Um, it's going to go next to Tokyo to be part of the Homelessness Strategy, and we believe that, that, that this Maslowian way of working um, should, should end. Um, I'm gonna skip through this and a little bit of the summit. But I just wanted to quickly say a couple of words about this, which was um, the Arts and Homelessness Summit included 16 uh, um, uh, countries represented, 250 delegates, 100,000 people visited um, some uh, uh, 53 different arts projects. But as a sort of central piece of art, um, homeless people from Manchester wanted to create a mural, which was doing this thing that we'll hear probably quite a lot about tomorrow, about perceptions and changing um, perceptions of homelessness. This is right in the centre of Manchester. A million people see this a year. The footfall is 20,000 a week. And this was a chance for 30 uh, homeless artists to say what they wanted to say about homelessness, not what people see about spice use and the assumptions they make, but their aspirations, their idea that they wanted to show something going from um, uh, uh, a challenge to a better future. So this is in Manchester, right uh, near Piccadilly Station. It's so you, when you come off Piccadilly Station approach at the bottom, it's, there's a built, uh, an office block called 111 Piccadilly, it's right along that wall there on Dale Street. Yeah, the man on the bench, the ring is David Toby. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And uh, who's now working for with One Voice? Um, one of the artists is now artist in residence at Manchester Museum, paid role, 
all the artists got paid. Um, and very, very finally, sorry, um, With One Voice is now um, a, a charity in its own right. It's spun off from Streetwise Opera. And on day one, we decided to have a, t a truly representative staff and board. So 50% of the board, 50% of the staff are people who have an insight of homelessness. We all believe that, um, you know, I started in a very privileged background 20 years ago as a support worker, very transactional job. There was the, there was the people who were helping and the helpless. This is all must be ended in co-production where our challenge is really that all organisations working in homelessness need to be uh, truly representative. Fantastic, thank you very much. seems to me uh, there's, a, there's a song um, the, from the early 20th century America from some of the workers' um, sort of struggles, a kind of la labour song, a poem that was turned into a song, and the, one of the key lines in it is, we want bread, but we want roses too. Um, and, and it seems to me that that's sort of what you're speaking to. Um, we are kind of over time, but maybe like one or two questions, if anyone <laughs> does have one, Richard. Yeah, um, early on in your presentation, uh, it was originally, um, but uh, too many people were turning up because of the size of the place that it's in. Too many people. It is. It's still open, but there's only a certain amount of people that you can have in because of fire safety regulations and stuff. But yeah, it is. There's still. I mean, there's still the soup kitchens are still on the streets every night, but we have this one that is open. Um, I think uh, seven till nine, Monday to Friday, and then on Saturday it's open two till seven. So, but yeah, it's, it's, it is opened up, but there's only a certain amount of people that can go in because the building's not very big. Peter, as a Manchester resident, you have a lot of questions. Great. <laughs> one, please, Peter. <laughs> one question, please. Just the one. Yeah, yeah good then. The driver group. The, the, so we've got so we've got the partnership board, which has got all the strategic leads and stuff like that. And the driver group is it's kind of um, to di not direct what the action groups do, but it's to make sure the action groups are doing what they supposed so what they set out to do and meeting their aims and stuff. But again, it's the co-produced, so there's people who get experience on it. There's also the CEO of some one of the charities and support workers and stuff like that on it. So it's. Yeah, but, but yeah, but well, they, so some of them are, some of them, and some of them need a, a kick up the arse and a bit of a push. <laughs> That's just how they are. Some of them are done by. So some of the people, the co-chair, the chairs of the action groups are strategic leads at the council or leads in health and stuff. So they need a kick up to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Think, but that's what we're there for.